today we are exploring web 5 and you may say Ian I didn't even realize we had gotten successfully to web 3 and we haven't and that is part of the point so today we are going to break it all down let's jump in Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur at Bitcoin Club, an all-around raging capitalist, and I'm excited to do today's video on Web5, which touches on a lot of interesting technologies and also forces us to assess objectively the current state of what many call Web3. So you're not going to want to miss a thing. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends. As always, it is a pleasure to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. If you like this type of content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us our merry growing gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including a whole slew of tutorials on how to acquire Bitcoin, secure it, privacy best practices, running your own node, as well as kind of tangential technology pieces and themes such as today's video. So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the meat for today. And I wanna to start with the motivation and what problem this is trying to solve. All right, so the concept of Web5 is being pioneered by TBD, which is part of Jack Dorsey's block. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about Web3, which is this sort of blanket term that means everything and nothing at the same time. And it's gotten its fair share of, I think, rightful criticism. But the intention at its really pure core, I think, is right. If we look at how the web has progressed over time, right, we might classify Web1 as this kind of basic, very static, web pages of the you know 1990s as we got into the 2000s you started to have more interactive web pages and content and it's important to note that with that you've had unparalleled access to information the democratization of that information to many around the globe interconnectedness all of this is generally speaking a good thing but we have started to see the negative externalities to the topography of Web2, which is essentially large tech platforms, you know, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world, etc. We've seen the rise of what people call surveillance capitalism. There have been large scale data breaches, big tech colluding with government agencies, right? All of this is happening and has been happening. And I think more and more people have woken up to it. And so you had Web3 that as a concept traces its roots potentially as far back as 2006. I think probably around 2014, 15, you see the term really kind of pop up more and more. And it's this idea of a more user-owned internet, one in which the user owns their data, controls their data, and who it's permissioned with. And the user has their own identity that they own, right? Today, maybe you have a Gmail account, right? Like that's an identifier that represents you but it's owned by Google. You may have a Twitter handle. Similarly, that's owned by Twitter. Twitter can at any time ban you from its platform. So again, this is an identity that you don't own. And so it's the desire to go from this kind of platform owned internet to this more user owned internet that has decentralized protocols at its core. And generally speaking, you would anticipate there to be some notion of identity, some notion of data storage, and some notion of value exchange that's sort of part of the Web3 umbrella concept. And in that latter piece, i.e. value exchange, therein you see things like you know blockchains that come into the conversation. And so you have these kind of overlapping technologies across both of these domains. So I would hope most people can agree that like these are real problems, right? You know, this kind of Web2 platform owned internet paradigm promulgates surveillance destroys privacy and there's also a kind of economic notion that platforms are able to accrue an outsized portion of the value that's created often by the users themselves and so the question is like okay get it how are things going right what is the current state of web3 and how are things going and jack dorsey made some waves back in december with this tweet when he started to comment on this subject he says you don't own web3 the VCs and their LPs do. It will never escape their incentives. It's ultimately a centralized entity with a different label. Know what you're getting into. So that's pretty interesting. Let's break that apart. 
I think really there are two main considerations that underpin what is a very fair criticism of this kind of Web3 term or set of technologies. For one, you do have these large insider token allocations which is typically protocols or companies and foundations that claim to be building decentralized protocols that are essentially pre-selling these tokens to VCs, investors, other insiders at an extremely cheap price before introducing that to the general public. And so we can see indeed this is true if we look at this diagram of various uh, kind of public blockchain ecosystems, uh, the blue is public sale, green community allocations, red is insiders, uh, and gray is kind of foundations and more. And you can see some particularly egregious examples. Like Solana is just, I mean, you know, basically half of it is insiders. And, you know, this minuscule sliver was for public sale. You know, Flow has 58% to insiders. Binance has 50%. But the evidence certainly does point to these large insider allocations. And so not surprisingly, in some of those tweets, Jack really went after A16Z or Anderson Horowitz, who's been one of the leading C's behind the kind of broader crypto and Web3 movement, and who indeed led the token sale for Solana. And so Elon said, on, this was back in December 21, has anyone seen Web3? I can't find it. And Jack says it's somewhere between A and Z. Jack later comments, you know, this mission statement, software is eating the world, always felt so dark. And lo and behold, Mark Andreessen, co-founder and general partner of A16Z, went on to block Jack. So he's banned from Web3. Now as a side note, it doesn't really help when the leader of one of the most prominent VCs in this entire space struggles to name use cases for Web3. I'll provide a link in the description down below to this uh, interview between Mark Andreessen and Tyler Cohen. And look, I don't wanna take anything away from Mark. I mean, he's an incredibly successful venture capitalist, but this video really is pretty eye-opening. And so you can start to understand the criticism here. And this is particularly the case when we're dealing with proof of stake blockchains. When VCs get a massive bag of either governance tokens or extremely cheap pre-sale tokens with proof of stake as your consensus mechanism, it's very difficult to kind of unseat the king over time. Now you would generally expect that, okay, well, you know, these VCs are gonna take profits, right? They're gonna dump on retail and make a return on their investment. And so you're gonna have these tokens get dispersed to the community that way, but that can be wishful thinking. And so you can end up with this never ending loop of, you know, of centralized entities basically commanding a huge portion of the stake that then allows them to essentially control the protocol in a compounding way. And in a way in which, as Jason Lowry often puts it, you can't countervail that type of actor. That's a huge problem. The second big reason for this valid criticism is the fact that a lot of these kind of applications that masquerade as you know, decentralized, et cetera, are often built on and using centralized infrastructure. A really good example of this is something like Infura with Ethereum, which provides APIs and essentially kind of infrastructure as a service to allow app developers to access data on the Ethereum blockchain. And so as an example of this issue, MetaMask, which is one of the biggest light wallets for Ethereum, uses Infura, which by the way, they both happen to be owned by the same parent company, Consensus. And earlier this year, Venezuelans lost access to MetaMask, the supposedly decentralized wallet application when Infura was fiddling with some of its configuration and parameters regarding sanctions that were driven by US and other jurisdiction directives. That doesn't sound very decentralized, does it? Plus, as something like Ethereum gets more and more and more complex, the cost of running a full node go up over time. And so you would expect that the percentage of total nodes being run off something like Infura will go up over time. Now, there's a fine line somewhere in here. The notion that sort of venture capital is bad or evil is absolutely not the conclusion. In fact, I think that's an extremely dangerous conclusion to reach from all this. Investors taking risks with capital and investing in entrepreneurs is the bedrock of capitalism and therefore prosperity. And furthermore, and I somewhat hesitate to make this argument, but it is the case, technically, that some of these token sales that have been made available to the public has allowed the average individual to participate sooner in some of these ventures and efforts than they otherwise would in the kind of traditional 
Web 2 world. I'm certainly not saying that as a justification for the thousands upon thousands of random crypto tokens that are complete nonsense and outright scams in many cases, but it is worth noting. But at the end of the day, I think the real crux of the issue is the narrative that proponents of Web 3 espouse and the reality that we see as evidenced by what we just discussed. And it's rational to be highly skeptical of this movement, given what we just saw in the world of DeFi, or decentralized finance, which is backed in structurally a very similar way as Web3. As Corey soberingly summarizes here, I don't think this is actually right, but like directionally, you know, was it all just a leveraged circle jerk? Did Alameda loan half a billion to Voyager, who loaned it to Galaxy, who loaned it to BlockFi, who loaned it to 3AC, who loaned it to Celsius, who put it in Anchor, and it all blew up and the daisy chain, you know, gets wrecked. Even if that's not precisely the correct sort of lineage and you know numerics here, this is generally what just happened. And so again, while the motivation behind decentralized finance, right? Like you have Bitcoin, you have money, you've perfected money, that's great. How do we now also get to decentralized forms of basic things like borrowing and lending that you would want to have? I totally get it. But we have basically seen total and complete degeneracy that has resulted in a lot of retail investors getting absolutely plowed over these last few months. And so having observed that, we should be particularly skeptical of this other thing that speaks of itself as this kind of very decentralized thing when it clearly has some very fundamental issues. Again, it's not about venture capital being good or bad. It's about average individuals being sort of pulled into something that's being sold as something that it's not. So. With that lengthy preamble, what does Web5 have to say about this? All right, so a lot of people have sort of pointed at Web5 as like, oh, this is just Jack Dorsey, Bitcoin maximalist, you know, trying to poo-poo on Web3 and any other blockchains that he doesn't like. When in reality, there's actually very little being spoken about in terms of Bitcoin within this. We'll talk about what is and isn't, but these are really just a set of protocols often based on open worldwide web consortium standards. So as we can see, Web5 is a decentralized platform that provides a new idea identity layer for the web to enable truly decentralized apps and protocols. And the naming, as we can see, is sort of a combination. It embraces the convenience of Web2, which is important, but it returns control to the users, which is really the ethos and the correct ethos and an ethos that we should all support of Web3. And so the harmony of these two views is what we're calling Web5. And so TBD in this blog post that I will link in the description down below, it's a great uh, recent blog post that just kind of goes through, provides a pretty high level overview, outlines three pillars of Web5. And these are similar to the components I was rattling off earlier that would typically go along with Web3 when people talk about that concept. And so you have decentralized identifiers, these are identifiers that individuals own. You have verifiable credentials, which is essentially self-sovereign identity, and you have decentralized web nodes, which speaks to things like data storage and message relay. Let's take a quick look at each of these pieces. Decentralized identifiers or DIDs are really just an identifier that allows a subject to prove control over that identifier without needing the permission or certification from some other authority. Uh, a la the you know Gmail uh, example we were talking about earlier. And so a did itself is this string of text, an example of which you can see at the bottom of this graphic, where you've got uh, what's called the scheme, the did method, and then some string that identifies the actual did subject. TBD advocates for something called ION, which is a did network built on top of Bitcoin, but it doesn't have to be anchored into a blockchain. It's not a requirement. And really as TBD notes in his blog post, this is kind of the only component or pillar that touches a blockchain of any kind. Now, they don't really speak to in this blog post the idea of value exchange, which I guess would be sort of parallel to Web5, uh, but presumably, you know, when you think of micropayments and just digital value exchange of any kind, one would imagine that Jack would envision that being conducted through something like the Lightning Network on Bitcoin. We can see the basic architecture here for what this looks like. So you basically have the did subject, which is, you know, maybe myself, 
Uh, I've got the did that refers to the subject, and that can resolve to or reference what's called a did document that contains data about the did subject. There's also a concept of a did controller that controls that document, uh, which in many cases can be the same entity as the did subject. But I think the most key concepts are dids referring to did subjects, as well as a did document that contains different information. And we can see an example of that here. It could include things like public keys, verification methods, which we'll get into, and other data that the user may wish to share with applications that may be requesting information from these did documents. The next component is verifiable credentials. And combined with dids, this really helps get us to self-sovereign identity. We have credentials of many kinds. If you think of your everyday life, maybe you have a driver's license, which asserts some capability of being able to operate a motor vehicle. You may have a university diploma, which reportedly asserts your understanding of some particular subject and so on and so forth. And so verifiable credentials is simply a way to present and have verified those types of credentials on the web. And when combined with decentralized identifiers, they really enable trustless interactions because claims about a did subject can be cryptographically verified. And so in this way, you can kind of distribute trust without having to reprove everything many, many times, you know, which is bad for privacy. So this does help with privacy. Um, it doesn't necessarily fully solve for this. You're always, you know, you're, you're still in some cases going to need to be able to present personally identifiable information. The example they use here is if a user Alice needs to prove that she has a bank account with Acme Bank, what would happen there is Acme Bank is able to issue a cryptographically signed verifiable credential that gets stored in Alice's wallet that can then be presented to the verifier who can verify that using information that's been published to, in this case, ION. And then finally, that gets us to decentralized web nodes. And this is basically what allows us to decouple our data from the applications that we use every day. So for example, your browsing history on YouTube is collected and owned by YouTube. Decentralized web nodes would allow individual users to host their own data and permission that data as they wish to the applications that need it. Now, importantly, I personally think it's wildly unlikely that you know the average individual is going to necessarily self-host their own data. But what's nice about this standard is you can have both encrypted or you know private data as well as public data. And that's an improvement certainly on the current status quo where a lot of cloud providers scan and see everything that you have. So this too is linked to your did via the did document. This is a more in-depth example where you also have the decentralized web node that is being listed as a service connected to the did Alice. And you have this endpoint which would allow applications to know where to request permission for data. So what are some potential use cases for this web three or web five, whatever we wanna call it. One example they highlight is this music application. It's the idea that maybe you could have your, you know, play playlists or preferences uh, as data stored in your decentralized web node. And so, you know, going from one music application to another, you can simply permission that new application to be able to read in your data so you don't have to, you know, recreate things. They also throw out this travel application. I think more generally speaking, this is really just how do you kind of bring your data together in a way in which various applications or in this case entities like hotels and airlines and car rentals uh, can all kind of access your remote decentralized web node and unify those different app experiences. There are definitely a lot of other use cases. Blue Sky is an example of like a decentralized Twitter that they're building out. Podcasting apps built on top of the Bitcoin Lightning Network that you could sort of already argue is kind of Web3. There's definitely stuff around digital assets and ownership. So obviously that's a lot of technical complexity wrapped into these different technologies. And so as they illustrate here, you would really need a slick sort of what they call identity wallet that allows the average individual to manage all of this. You know, you'd have data management, the ability to create new DIDs and associate those DIDs with various uh, pieces of data and things like that. I mean, it would have to be really, really easy. It would presumably have the ability to manage uh, different key pairs, be that, you know, for your Bitcoin or for different kind of credentials. I think we're frankly a long ways off from seeing this come to full fruition, but I think it's a really important conversation to be having now, nonetheless, especially as things move as fast as they do. There you have it. Let's go ahead and wrap today's video up.
All right, so we took a look at Web 5. We first started with the motivation behind why even something like Web 3 in concept is something that I think we can really get behind. But there are some very valid criticisms for why Web 3 in its current form has not lived up to this promise of a decentralized user-owned web by any means. You could also argue, well, it's early days and these things take time. And this is true, but I also think there's enough kind of grifting out there to where we should really have have a skeptical eye and have frank, honest conversations about what is truly decentralized and what is not. But I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the current state of Web3? And what are your thoughts on what's being proposed with Web5? Leave me your comments down below, but I hope this at least shed some light on what I think is a really important conversation and set of technologies. If you found this valuable and insightful, you already know what to do. Give this a like share this out. That really does help the algorithm get this in front of more people and subscribe if you haven't already, because I'll definitely be covering related topics in future videos. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, my friends, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then.